And God's wrath is slow to come. God is so patient, long suffering. Second Peter 3 9. God wishes that none should perish, but all to come to repentance. God doesn't want to send wrath. That's not who God is. Right? He is so patient. If he wasn't patient, I wouldn't be standing here today. And you wouldn't be sitting here today. <laughs> Amen. 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 God's, I, I said this, and this is my words. Didn't read this anywhere. This is what I wrote. God's wrath is those things, so much so that I believe it is not as much as God bringing his wrath upon us as it is we bring it upon ourselves. Amen. God's wrath is over here. And it's been being held back even by, you know, the Holy Spirit's finally the restrainer, the great restrainer he has been called. And you can read it in Thessalonians, you know, the great restrainer has been restraining all this evil and even restraining the devil. And he's been taken up out. He's finally gone. And then all hell breaks loose on earth, right? So even in that, God has been very restraining this wrath. But it's got to come at some point. The, and we can think theologically, there has to be wrath. I want to get to that in a few moments. But I think it's more us bringing it upon ourselves than God just laying, sitting up there going, man, I got to have some. Just wait for Ralph to mess up, man. I'm going to get him. You know, he starts throwing him down. That's not it at all. Right? But ain't there a joke about that where the light bulb almost hits, hits the guy and the guy's like, oh. God almost got me, and then there's a voice from heaven. Dang, missed again. You know, <laughs> if God wants to take you out with lightning, he's going to take you out. God, if he wants to throw a hailstone, he's going to hit you on the head every time, right? But that's not who God is. We bring the wrath, I believe, more upon ourselves. It is a punishment, but it's really a consequence of our sinful action. It's not just God giving us a whipping or pouring his wrath out. There has to be a consequence. Let's talk about this theologically just for a moment. What if there was no wrath? Could there be a heaven without a hell? People have asked me, why don't everybody just get to go to heaven? Well, then you'd have earth. And quite frankly, I may sound selfish, but if this is heaven, you can have it. If there's going to be a heaven, there has to be a hell. That's the counterbalance. If there's going to be something right, there's going to be something over here that's wrong. If there are going to be rewards, there has to be loss. It's not a participatory heaven. People don't you know, talk about this in our society. Uh, I could go on about this for half an hour about a woke society and the whole concept of the participatory uh, ribbon. You know, there, if there's a winner, there's going to be a loser. I mean, there's going to be, there's good and there's bad. There's heaven, there's hell. There's, there's got to be, if there's rewards, there's loss. There has to be wrath if there's blessings and grace. Otherwise, it all just comes together in the middle and it's just a big old pot of gray, right? So when we think, why, why is there wrath? Because there's something completely the opposite of wrath. And it's called grace and mercy and love. Ezekiel 33, 11, I love this verse. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, Listen to what he says. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But rather that the wicked would turn from his way and live. And then it's in big quotes. It says, turn back. Turn back. This is God saying, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? Can you see the passion of our God? Can you see him saying, turn back. 
Why do you want to go into the lake of fire? When, why do you want the wrath when I'm going to give you grace and mercy? Why do you want this earth when I'm going to give you my son Jesus? Why do you want to live in sin when I'm going to give you redemption? Turn back, Israel. Turn back. That's God's heart. That's who God is. That's who God's saying. Why, house of Israel, will you do this? This ain't God saying, I'm going to get him. It's the complete opposite. God's saying, why? Why do you want to do this? That's who God is. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. God destined us for what? Wrath. God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. But if you choose not to, O house of Israel, if you reject Jesus Christ, then the only alternative is wrath. And you will bring it upon yourself. That's not the scripture. The scripture just says, God is not destined for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. But Ezekiel 33, 11 speaks passionate to me. He says, O oh Israel, why? 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 God is holy. God is holy. Sin is a problem. God cannot tolerate, accept, or allow sin into heaven. He ain't having it. Sin cannot be overlooked. It's got to be dealt with. And what my note here says, and it's underlined, we are not able to solve this problem in and of ourselves. Amen. Our government's not going to solve it. NASA's not going to solve it. The smartest preachers in the world isn't going to solve it. Nobody's going to solve it but the one who was able to. Who was because he lived under the law, he fulfilled the law, he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. 13,000 days, every day of his life, he got up and lived by that law, and he never failed, not one time. Amen. Every day he came, and he came from heaven to glory, started in a barn, raised, and he never sinned, never sinned. Every day was a sacrifice to carry a cross, to earn the right to carry a cross. The suffering to die. And he didn't want to. And them Romans didn't keep Jesus on the cross. It was his love for us that kept him. Right. He had to do it. And God had to stand by and and watch him do it. Because he can't deal with sin. God is holy and God is just. Let's go to Romans 3. This will be my last verse for today. Romans 3. There's a key word that's in my note. It's propitiation. Everybody say propitiation. Propitiation. Now, I was going to not put it up there and actually spell it. <laughs> the word propitiation means appeasing, means it's satisfied. Sufficient. I added the word sufficient. And here's what it says. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Whom God displayed publicly. The humiliation, the mocking. Who God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be, listen to this, the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I love that, that God is just but he's also the justifier. He provides the way through the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. He graciously does what we cannot do 
for ourselves. Even God, uh, the plan, you know, he, he instigated this entire plan. In Galatians 4.4, 4, it says, into the fullness of time, he brought Jesus into the world, right? He did everything. He, he brought Jesus. He made the plan. The only way that it could work was for the Lamb of God to die on the cross. Amen. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. God is just. He can't allow sin in. No matter how much he loves you, Ronnie, he can't say, well, you got that little sin. Oh, it's okay. Come on. He can't. He's got to deal with the sin because he's just. But he's also the justifier. Because then he says, bro, I got a plan. You come to Jesus by faith, and Jesus paid your price. Amen. He's Amen. just, but he's the justifier. And beyond that, beyond Ronnie going, man, I, I need the Lord. How gracious is God? Ronnie's just blah, 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 living his life, never leaving. And God is going after him with his prevenient grace. That's a whole other sermon. God seeks us. Seeks us out. The potter and the clay. You got that old lump of clay named Ronnie. He formed him. And first he had to get him up out of that pit. And he went out and he found him and he got him and he, he frees him from the pit. And then he purifies him and he makes him mold him. And then he puts him in the fire. Now I'm in Jeremiah, right? Yeah, the whole thing of the potter and the clay. God in his provenient grace seeks us. And I'm like, man, that is so awesome that he does that for us. Think of how much he has done. And here you go. Or perhaps better said, what he had to do in your own life. Some of y'all is easy. God's kidding. I think God looks down and goes, now that, now that Mary Ann, she's just, she was a good girl and she did this and she just comes here, it was pretty easy. But that Tim Primey, man, oh man, that guy was something else. <laughs> man, the, the stuff I had to do to get to him. I mean, you know, it, it, it's just like, I, can, I, I know in my heart what he had to do. You know? And he had to find me and man, he had a lot of work to do in me. I, I, I put him through some stuff. But in the wrath, when God is just, we'll see that in Revelation 20, verse 11, great white throne judgment. God, God is just, right? Can't deal with sin. And if you don't want Jesus, he'll give you justice. When man chooses his own way, God in his infinite justice will then judge man based on the law, the commandments, his moral standards. I can't let anybody in with sin. I gotta, I'm just, right? And I'm holy, but I'm just. And here's my question. Does anyone want justice with God? Mercy, mercy, mercy. I've heard people say, I just want what's, come, what's due me. <laughs> it's like, lob it up. Here it comes, brother. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, Really? You want that? Well, let me tell you why. Let me tell you about my Jesus, that song we sang a week or so ago. In all of this, because of sin, we deserve God's wrath. And we deserve hell. We do not deserve his grace in heaven. But because God is love, 1 John 4.8. Write that down, 1 John 4.8. God isn't just some manifestation of love. God isn't just somebody that's really good and understands love. God didn't just create love and marriage and even sex and everything else that he created. It's all good inside of marriage. God didn't just create love. God is love. Amen. Amen. His very nature is character. It's not a wrath. God is love. First John 4 8. And because of that, because of God is love, I put it in blue bold letters there. We get not what we deserve, which is right. We get what we choose. Amen. 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 Father, thank you. In the midst of the wrath and revelation, it's hard to see our world and probably our brothers and sisters and people we may even know. 
I mean biological by brothers and sisters because Lord, where do we know we won't be here for that part because we may have other family members and friends that might be here. This, they talk about getting bad. It's going to really be bad. But God, you have spared us from that wrath. You have not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through Jesus Christ. So Lord, if there's someone here today that thinks they want justice, or thinks they want what they got coming to them, I pray they would repent. And Father, if there's anyone here that's just struggling with trust, the Lord, this will just reinforce and say, you know, I see what God's going to do in this world because, you know, because of the wrath that has to come. But that's not who God really is. That's not His character and nature. He's a loving God. No matter what I'm going through. If He took me out on the way home today and took me to heaven, pray for the Lord. Because I don't deserve any of that. But I love it, Lord, you did it all. And we don't get what we deserve, but we get what we choose. I pray today we choose you for salvation, for deliverance. And we give our lives and hearts to you. Reaffirm that faith. Maybe for the first time or the hundredth time, but Lord, every day, every day, we get up and we thank you, God, for what you're doing in our hearts and lives. Lord, just have your will and way in each part in this place this morning. For your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Please stand.
old story of the old preacher. He'd been around forever. And they asked him, said, all your years of preaching, share with us what God has taught you. He got up to the pulpit and he said, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. That's it. God is not destined us for wrath, but for salvation through Jesus Christ. Just another moment. If you feel that, you come. God's house. Amen. 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 Let me just do take a moment because um, I think Jen sent us a text and just to let you know that starting Friday, October the 14th through Monday, October the 17th, that the exits, both exits here at Mount Zion on 75 will be closed. Northbound, southbound, everything because they're going to redo this exit. So if you if you come to church, you might find a different way if you get off at Mount Zion uh, at the interstate. Uh, they're saying in addition, Friday e evening, eight o'clock, starting at eight o'clock that Friday evening, uh, Mount Zion Road will be closed between uh, Tiburon Road and Biltmore Avenue. Um, it's a detour using 237 Gunpowder Road, 42, whatever. Just to make you aware, if you come across there, they're gonna be closed on the, uh, the exits to the interstate, both north and south. You won't be able to, if you're coming south to get here, you won't be able to use those. If you're coming north, whatever, you won't be able to do that, okay? Yeah. Are you getting my attention? Is that what you're wanting? Go ahead. Go ahead? All right. We'll ask everybody to stay for just a moment. Okay, cool. Um, I, I just want to echo what Tim had said. You know, it's, it's a privilege for me, uh, for Betty and I both, to be serving here. We've been here since 2011, thereabouts. Uh, I've known Tim and Judy before we even came to Bethesda. We, we've known them forever. And never in my wildest dreams or visions or thoughts did I ever think that we would be together in ministry. And we, 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 we worship together at, uh, at Ashton Avenue Baptist Church, but never did I ever dream that he would be my pastor and I would be his pastor. But let me tell you something. He's one of the best pastors that I've ever had. Amen. I love I love him and Judy with all my heart. Um, we've had some disagreements as we do that because brothers will disagree. But we've always come back and we've loved each other. And, it, and it's been a blessing to be here at Bethesda. We left for a, a couple of months. We were helping another church to get started. And we, we left for a little bit and came back. Of course, this is our home. Uh, but I just want to say I love this guy. I love serving beside him. He is such a blessing. He and Judy have been a blessing to Betty and I, and we love them. We love Bethesda. We love serving you. Uh, it, it's just a joy. It's not a service to me. It's a joy uh, to, to be about what the Lord has for us here. And I'm excited for what the future holds. Uh, our youth group is growing. The children's ministry is growing. We're getting folks in. Uh, God is doing a mighty, mighty thing here at Bethesda, and he's allowing us to be a part of it. It's just a joy uh, to be there. Agreed. Yes. The other day, I, I ran into somebody, and uh, she said, I heard Greg retired. I was like, from what? <laughs> <laughs> she said, from the ministry. And I said, oh, no, ma'am, he hasn't retired. I said, he's still going. I said, we're with uh, Tim and Judy. And uh, she says, well, that's really good. She's somebody that we go to church with. And she goes, well, I guess it fits, huh? And I said, yes, ma'am, it fits. <laughs> <laughs> and it does. It, it fits real good. Uh, the few months that we were gone, my heart was sick. My heart was sick. And I'm just glad we're back. Amen. Some folks call us Laurel and Hardy, I guess. You know what you say. <laughs> <laughs> they call us. <laughs> but it's, it's awesome. It's really great. And we love you folks. But more than that, we love the Lord. And we love serving him. Uh, I believe there is a dinner following. Is that correct? Do you want me to ask the blessing on the dinner now as I, as I pray? Okay, you can do that. Let's pray together then. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this privilege and honor to serve you in this place. 
What a privilege it is to serve with Tim and Judy, Father. I'm a blessed man serving with these folks. I thank you for these fine, fine folks at Bethesda. Lord, I love them. And I pray your richest blessing upon each and every one of them and their families. Help us, Father, as pastors, as leaders, to follow your leadership in leading them and shepherding this flock. Because it is a privilege and it's an honor. Lord, we're going to stumble and stub our toe along the way. But Father, we pray that you would guide us and direct us and lead us. Because it's our desire to preach your word and to love your people. Lord, thank you again for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. And Lord, we ask your blessing upon this time of fellowship and this food this afternoon. And the hands you have prepared. Thank you again for your love and mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now you want everybody to sit down? Is that what you want to do? It's time to eat. I can't sit down. My stomach's growling now. Tim, Chris, and Greg. I'm already here. On behalf of the fans, we are so blessed to have you here down here. And we thank you so much for all of you. And their ladies also. Praise the Lord. and middle of the night visits and everything that you do in the ministry and how much it takes the support of their life yeah. to serve in a ministry. And I heard one time several years ago that the average life of a pastor in a Southern Baptist church was around five to seven years. We have been blessed beyond all measure. Mm -hmm. So if you won't come up, if you guys will get down here, we just want to lay hands on you and pray. Thank you for these men and their wives, Lord. They're a team. They were called as a team. They answered as a team. They can't be one without the other. They are equally yoked and called to serve you and your ministry, Lord. And it's tough. It's really tough at times. We don't always understand everything they go through. And I, I know that it's sometimes easy to say, I don't want to do this anymore, Lord, but they hang in there. All these years and all their service and everything that they do behind the scenes that many of us never know. Lord, I just ask you to lay your hands upon them and bless them in a mighty way. We're so thankful for them all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Love you.
Which one was mud? Tall one or I'm not sure, brother. You me either. I knew they had the water blades, but they had the, uh, the shoe blade. You know, the little shoe. In the cartoon, you know, when the car stripped, they had the shoes with wheels. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Back in the 30s. Like the skating skate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very If you want to. There's Pastor Tim. <laughs> Love you. Did you see those books? I saw there were books. I didn't look at them yet. You'll like them. I will. Now wait a minute, I got the four musketeers here. Let me get a picture of this. I got the four musketeers here. That's right. I knew it was going to be gone. 